I could eliminate the monster aspect um, from from her. It was she was now more human and real, and my sister, right to me. Hello, and welcome to the Prestasi Conversations. I'm Aaron Gould, and I will be your host for this series of in-depth discussions that will cover such topics as sex, human rights, education, trauma recovery, and CSA prevention. On today's show, I'm speaking with Bertie Lynn. She is the author of the book, Through the Storm of Early Trauma, Healing and Overcoming. Her book covers all of the events that helped shape and make her into the incredible woman she is today. From such things as witnessing the murder of a child and friend, to the physical and psychological abuse from her father, to the racism that she encountered and eventually confronted in her high school, to the sexual abuse from a sibling, running away from home in a sense to try to find some independence, and the unfortunate betrayal and sexual abuse from a childhood friend. She has had a trying yet remarkable journey and she's here today to talk to us about her triumphs in overcoming trauma. In part one of this interview, we're gonna discuss such things as body ownership, depression, friendship, and ultimately, forgiveness. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Bertie Lynn. Uh, Bertie, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, I read your book. Uh, I sat down one early Sunday and I figured, I'll just read a little bit. And then like eight hours later, I was done. <laughs> I just, I, I couldn't put it down and I needed to know, yeah. I needed to know more. And it's a very fascinating yeah. story. It's also a very, uh, it gets real. People can associate with, maybe not to some of the extremes, but people can associate with some of the feelings and the emotions that you were de dealing with. One of the things you talked about initially, right from the get-go, you were talking about night terrors because mm -hmm. of your abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, is this something that you still deal with today? I don't. Not for anything I faced in my childhood, um, but for recent you know, traumas in, in my life, things like that. Yes, I um, I have dreams that scare me every once in a while, but nothing like what I experienced um, from my childhood trauma in my early 20s. I mean, I would wake up in night sweats and, you know, just be just terrified. And what, so what did you do to uh, com combat that, to deal with that? Uh, initially, not go to sleep <laughs> and just stay up all night. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so you chose the healthy path. Okay. I got right. yeah. Um, you know, I didn't know, you know, at the time didn't know where they were coming from. Um, mm -hmm. I, I knew what they were about, but I didn't know why they were haunting me. Right. And so I didn't necessarily know how to deal with it. And so I think one of the first things I had to acknowledge was that, you know, okay, this, I, I recognize that this is an issue. Right. And then just acknowledging, OK, I need to, to change this. I, the, there's something I need to do, you know, because this is an, an, an issue. It's a problem um, to have this and be this scared and wake up this right. and feel this frightened. And a lot of what I would experience is like just anxiety. So it was hard to go back to sleep um, because you have, you know, just my insides just felt like they were shaking and my heart was just pounding. I just couldn't I couldn't calm down. So that, that fight or flight. Yeah. Did you find, uh, as you would go through your day before it was time to go to sleep, uh, could you look back and find things, like when you're reviewing your day, like, oh, this probably triggered this, or were you able to kind of categorize that? <laughs> That's a great question, and absolutely not. Like the, the These were, I would go to bed, I mean, they just randomly came. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it wasn't as if, I mean, that I know it's probably, you know, unconsciously there's, there was, you know, or, and even subconsciously, it may be a trigger that I didn't maybe realize, but I just think it was something that, um, was haunting me. Um, and, you know, I was afraid and there was no way that, um, I could be attacked by, you know, my, my, um, my older sibling. But at the same time, <laughs> it was a very real feeling sure. um, as if she was going to attack me. Like, um, and I think once I got down to the bottom of it, I had never told on her. And I think that was something that had probably just, again, um, 
you know, subconsciously just had been bothering me that I had dealt with all this stuff and I never was able to really tell my parents about it. Right. Yeah. And I, and I saw a counselor and I told the counselor, but I still didn't, I still, I still had those nightmares. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember the counselor exploring, had I shared it with my parents? And it's like, no, well, why not? Um, at this point in my life, what was I afraid of? Well, I didn't know. And I had to realize that I was still afraid as an adult to tell them, ex you know, what happened. And I think the fear stim is simulated from not, um, or being looked at in a different light, in, mm. in, in a different manner. That same fear I experienced when I was little and not wanting to say anything for fear, one, that they would like hurt her for doing that. You know, maybe she did. I thought my dad would kill her at that point. Yeah. Um, or like for me, um, them look at me differently now, you know, cause I wasn't innocent and I was going through this thing and I wasn't their innocent little girl anymore. When this happens, there's a, a sense of shame that comes along with it. Um, and I was still ashamed to tell them that this happened. Um, at that, it, it, you know, just even at an older age, you know, right. But when I, I did and I did share it, you know, there were there were questions there were why why didn't you ever tell us? Well, I was afraid. <laughs> well, that doesn't make any sense. You should have still told us. Mm -hmm. And I just think that and and they addressed it with with my older um sister and she confirmed and she was apologetic about it. Um she was apologetic about it to them. We didn't actually get a chance to address it and talk about it um, until she, um, we had the opportunity to, to, to meet up. Um, she was in prison the whole time. Oh. So when she was released, um, you know, we were, I was able to, to meet her and she apologized to me in person. Oh. Um, and that meant the world for me. Um, and I was able to, now, again, I was dealing with this in my twenties, me telling my parents about it kind of gave me a sense of relief. I addressed her about it in a letter and she apologized through the letter, but nothing's like, you know, that validation and apology when it's in person. Right. You can oh, actually... absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, about 10 years later, I was able to actually hear from her mouth, um, you know, I'm sorry. And I could see the sincerity and I could see the change. Um, and so it really helped me move on. Did that bring you closer to her when she apologized? And, and did that, how did that alter your relationship for better? I would, I would hope. Absolutely. I was able to truly move on in my heart and in my mind. There was no reason at that point to go back and say, well, you did this you know, or, right, or like, yeah. you know, just constantly rehashing something that we, we just buried. So once you forgive, you have to move on. And that's one thing that I had to learn. If you continue to use it as, um, uh, an excuse to punish that person, then you're going to rehash all of those feelings all over again and relive them and then be angry all over again. Now you have to start out, start over in forgiveness and addressing right. why is this still bothering me? So the, the, that's the one thing that I, I learned is true freedom. Um, that once, you know, I had addressed it with her that I was able to then move forward and actually like really forgive her. And it did bring us close, you know, to where, you know, not super close, but just close to where, like, you know, I could eliminate the monster aspect um, right. from, from her. It was, she was now more human and real and my sister, right, to me. Yeah. Um. So, so that was, that was a huge blessing because, um, for me because there was still so much anxiety and, um, and just kind of fear of what she would truly say in person. You know, I had to assess what, whether that was real or not. Like I've changed, you know, I've, I've grown and I've, and so it was more or less, well, well then can, can we talk about the situation? <laughs> um, yeah. And I had to tell her how I was feeling and 
how she made me feel and all of the emotions and feelings and, you know, things that, you know, just came out of that and in my life. And I told her about the nightmares and, and everything. And she, you know, there's not much that you can do when you're the offender, right? But listen, sure. you know, listen and hear, um, you know, what the person you, you, you know, violated had to go through. And so she felt really, really bad and she, you know, apologized, but there was not much that she could do. So my expectations were just to receive validation from her and for her to say, you know, just confirm, you know, yeah. so. I want to talk for a second, uh, if you're comfortable talking about your, your brother when he came to stay with you and his game as you, I believe it was referred to in the book, with hindsight, with time away from it and able to reflect and review, do you feel that he was trying to push you into something abusive or do you feel he was just uh, in a state of trying to you know, figure himself out as, as kids at that age do sometimes? The, yeah, absolutely the latter. Um, okay. I just feel that there was a sense of curiosity um, and I feel like I just, like I described his face because it was a face of like, no, this isn't the way, you know? And it was just right. like, and so, and that was my, you know, like that was my brother. Like he was, um, he means the world to me and I didn't have a brother. He was my only brother. Right. And so I didn't know what he, he didn't do anything to hurt me. You know, he, he did um, what I guess any, and, and I eventually experienced like, you know, boys who are just curious about their bodies or just, you know, what have you. Like yeah. he just flashed me, you know? Right. Um, but had he tried to do anything further physically, I think that would have turned into a, tra to me in my head, like a traumatic experience to where he's now hurt me, physically right. hurt me. Um, but I didn't understand and, and I didn't come away from that experience um, with any like traumatic damage um, regarding that. But I felt it was important to mention because that is where it starts. The curiosity, the age around, you know, um, you know puberty, parents leaving their kids alone. Um, and, and they're in those stages is not a good idea, like ever, right. um, you know, and so I, that's why I mentioned that because there is a curiosity, um, and you don't know what could happen or what's going on. If my sisters had not been there, um, I don't, I still don't think anything would have happened. Right. Um, but you know, my, my older sister was pretty adamant banging on the door you know, basic, why is this law? Like both of them, we talked, we talked about it. Um, when I, when I was writing this and it's like, you know, is it, is an incident they very much so both remember, you know, mm -hmm. trying to look under the door, trying to get through the door, banging on the door, you know, open it. Well, and then I know there was the incident, there were the boys in the neighborhood. Yes. That did something similar. And I, and mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, one of those boys comes back later which is both of them both of them yeah uh which is something that i want to kind of come back to you also talked uh, around that time about uh, your sense of body ownership mm -hmm. which i think is very important for mm -hmm. anyone to have uh, what do you feel were the catalysts for that sense of ownership um what what made you come to that realization like this is my body this is no one else's well i think i had always I guess known, right? right? Um, because I feel like, and again, I, like I had to, I like was my own expert, right? <laughs> um, just as a child, like you, everyone's their own expert. Like they know their bodies, they know, you know, um, what they're what they're thinking and and what's going on. And so, for me, I had never, I had never experienced anyone violating, um my body, my personal space and invading that, um, right. you know, my, not, my parents didn't, um, you know, 
up until, you know, my sister started that, like, she hadn't, like, nobody even attempted. And like I said, I was flashed. <laughs> yeah. But he didn't, he didn't do anything. And so it was just like, you know, I just, I knew, like, instantly when, um, you know, that first, that first, initial time and, and I explained that in detail because that's the first time that you no know, anybody had ever violated my body and the struggle um like a a child it really like I think I had that sense of ownership because when she went towards my private areas um I knew that wasn't right Right. So you have a sense right. of right and wrong. Um, exactly. And so those are the areas where I'm like, no, that, what are you doing? Like now, if she went to say, oh, let me see your arm. OK, who cares? <laughs> right, but exactly. if it was, you know, something that had to do with. Um, you know, I think I just connected the dots of, you know, we wear underwear, we wear, you know, I, I see my mom wears her bra, like, you know, just my dad wears his underwear, like we're not walking around naked. <laughs> so we're protecting certain areas. And I think I had the sense of, of right and wrong on, on, on that just, you know, does it feel right? Or does it feel right. wrong? And so essentially, I, I fought, like, you know, no, you know, on what was happening and and then that's when I experienced someone physically trying to harm me for the first time now I'm getting pinched now I'm getting you know um I mean it was different from a spanking it wasn't a spanking was because I did something wrong I didn't do anything wrong you know or sometimes it was I did something wrong or you know <laughs> but, no I understand yeah but you yeah. see what I'm saying like um if spanking came from mom and dad um, so what is my sister doing? Why is she pinching me because I'm not doing this? Like, why is she? Yeah. So there were, there were, you know, all of those thoughts. And then after initially, um, you know, like I said, it happened. I felt ashamed. I felt um, out of, um, you know, just like out of sorts. I just, I didn't feel like me. Um, mm. I, I hated my, my body for how the feelings, you know, that I felt and right. I hated that I had to go through that. And so, you know, having the sense of um, ownership for, you know, your body when you're a child. And then when someone violates that, you ha go through a whole level, uh, you know, another level of emotions where you, you don't like yourself. You lose confidence. You withdraw. You become quiet. I mean, I could, it's so sad i can always tell when a child has been through something because the ones who haven't really they're free and buoyant and they're just bouncing around and they're innocent and they're like you know in people's faces and and they're outgoing and then you can tell the child who's been through something and they're withdrawn nice. or they're angry yeah. they're aggressive you were you talk about how uh, depression kind of became a baseline mm -hmm. And uh, there's an incident that you mention in the book uh, where you're running at school and there you see the, the soda can. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what were you looking for in that moment? Was it an end or was it a cry or was it, I mean, can you talk some about that? Um, I did not want to be here on this earth, period. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank God I didn't find a gun because I, I wouldn't be here talking to you. And that during running, um, while I was running and those kids were doing that, and my dad had um, just given me a beating for um, something I did not do, had n nothing to do with. And, you know, yeah. after this incident, the kids fessed up. And, right. And, I, and you know, to this day, I, <clears throat> I know he has kind of like, it was like there was no sense of remorse um, from my dad. Um you know, ab about it. And, and I really, honestly, I think I, cause I, I, I tried to block out a lot of stuff, um, that just constantly, you know, had hurt me, but, um, 
you know, my dad's just kind of like, okay, it didn't happen. Get over it. You probably needed the spanking for something anyways. Right. And that's not the attitude to have. Like I literally, after, after being beaten, um, and geez, and, you know, reading the story of the Bible with Jesus and him, you know, losing his life or something, he didn't do. you know, I'm just wow. like, you know, and I'm definitely not comparing myself to Jesus, but just saying like that emotion, that feeling of if you didn't do anything, but an officer came in there right now and said, you're going to jail and we're going to put you, um, you know, in the execution chamber. And you know you didn't do anything. What are those emotions going through your head? And so sure, yeah. for me, it was just like that. Like I'm, I'm about to experience this painful experience, um, you know, for absolutely nothing, for for just cruelty from these kids who thought it was funny to put me um, on the chopping block, and the adult that couldn't really understand like he's believing these kids and couldn't see that I was just innocent. I gave him my whereabouts. I gave him and, it, it, and, yeah. and how rude and ugly he was towards me. And then went to go get my dad. Um, and then of course my dad's embarrassed and who knows what he said to my dad, <clears throat> but I'm sitting there begging and pleading those kids as they just look down like this. I'm like, please tell them the truth. Like I had nothing to do with this. I don't even know why you're fighting. I'm, you know, yeah. And that adult to just say, I've heard enough. What? <laughs> so yeah, to make their mind up. Yeah. yeah. So to imagine, can you imagine being told, you know, he, I mean, my dad, he had this thing where he, you know, for us to feel more pain so that we didn't do, we would think about it more before we do, you know, a certain thing again, he would make us pull down our pants and our panties. And so he'd see the raw flesh, you know, with the belt. And um, he had a thick leather belt. And I mean, and when he came down with that belt, it wasn't like light touches. He, it was like, he was bearing his soul. I mean, that's, that is some old school punishment right there. That is some, his reaction to it. It seemed to me that your father had control issues, things that were out of his control. Mm -hmm. He took out on his kids and his wife and, and the the more he was out of control the the higher extent of the punishment would be i just remember all the licks i got and each lick i, I got i was just angry i was angry and it just and and to be in that situation if i can explain it to you and anyone who's listening to be in a situation where you're constantly being um just bullied and you know you're in a, a a home like I was in and you're being abused like that I mean for me that's abuse <laughs> um and you you just like you know your your problems would become larger than life and at that point I'd asked myself the question why am I here is this what life is going to be like for me like, I didn't see a future. I didn't see a future past, you know, what was going on. You know, I didn't see that I was going to have a happy life. I just felt like I was right. constantly being, you know, picked on and, and all this these negative things were happening to me. And I didn't want any part of it anymore. And so yeah. that day, those kids, after they got me um, <clears throat> that beating for nothing, um, I was facing suspension and... and <clears throat> And, and, and just all of that, like, and they're taunting and teasing me I, that day at the track, I'm telling you, it could have been anything. Thank God there wasn't a gun or a knife. Cause I just wanted to be out of there. I wanted to die. But that, that day brings us to an important person in your life. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Tikoya. Yes. Um, both preacher's kids, mm -hmm. uh, do you develop this connection? She's there for you. She is just like, it's so funny because people like when she's around me and then people who meet her for the first time, it's like, or even like if virtually or just through the phone, it's like they feel her energy and they're like, oh my God, like I love her, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so you can only imagine for, for, 
And, you know, that was a, a God thing for me, like just for her to be there in the office at that time. And they're like, hey, can you go sit with her? You know, um, I was, you know, she really took me under her wing and she honestly just loved on me. Right. She poured into me. She loved on me. This sounds like, you know, when you have a friendship, it should be like a two way thing. Right. And it was right. to some extent. But I think she she wanted to guard me from having to um, deal with major like, you know, like major issues that maybe she had, was dealing with. Um, now, of course, you know, there were just the the nuances of being a kid, so we talk about what we like, what we didn't like, clothes and stuff like that, and boys and all of that. But I just, you know, I I, t- I remember telling her, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to write a book about my childhood. And I said, I want you to read it. And I just want to apologize to you in advance that I never did share, you know, a lot of the things with you. It's because I was ashamed. And um, t- to have, to have, to, to then go through reliving those moments between my um, editor Tracy and you know then going to my counselor right after (laughs) um, our sessions it was like I said a very cathartic movement in my life and I was able to kind of you know almost like like heal I heal from those moments but Sequoia was just monumental in my life um, and I needed her then yeah, she she just uh, she just seemed amazing. She just uh, and and it's like you said, it was it was one of those right time, right place. And sometimes as you go through life, you just kind of meet these people that are meant to be there for you, mm-hmm. and you're there for them. And so mm-hmm. it's just yeah, I I uh, uh, I don't know her. I've I've never met her. I've never seen her. I've never talked to her. I might have a little crush. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Um, Don't worry, everybody does. In part two of our conversation, Birdie and I will talk about her high school years and how she eventually confronted racism with the help of an Oprah poem, how she ran away from home in an attempt to try to find herself and a sense of independence, and the unfortunate betrayal of a childhood friend that led to a very traumatic experience. I hope you enjoyed this first part of my discussion with Birdie Lynn, and will join us again on the Protasia Conversations. Thank you for watching.